Welcome to another session of the Change Leadership Conversations. Today I have with me Dr. Wendy Sukir. She's a professor at the Ted Rogers School of Management and the founder of the Diversity Institute at Ryerson University. Welcome, Wendy. Thanks for having me. <laughs> no, I should say thank you for being part of this. The first time I heard you speak about diversity and inclusion, I was literally blown away. I love the stats you were providing. I, I love the practicality. I loved your style of delivery. And we said we have to have you for our conference specifically. But now that the conference has been postponed to 2021 with the whole of the COVID crisis, I'm glad that you could join us on the Change Leadership Conversations today. So thank you. Very pleased to be included. <laughs> so, Wendy, tell us a little bit, first of all, about the role of diversity and inclusion just generally in today's fast-paced and disruptive business environment. So we know it's playing a key role in all of the COVID crisis. But before we get to that, share a little bit more with us on the role of diversity and inclusion when it comes to leading and driving change. Sure. Well, you know, I teach in a business school, and so my view of diversity and inclusion is grounded, of course, in a commitment to human rights and what is fair. But I have a real laser focus on why it's critically important for organizations trying to achieve their goals and objectives. And we've done work in the ITC sector. We've mm -hmm. work in financial institutions. We've done work with government, with educational institutions with healthcare. More recently, we're working with sports organizations. And it's very, very clear to me that regardless of the sector, we can show ways in which having a strategic approach to diversity and inclusion will help you attract the best and the brightest, mm -hmm. help you enter new markets, mm. help you innovate better, help you avoid risk. So mm. From my point of view, uh, diversity and inclusion shouldn't be treated as a responsibility of your HR department, which mm -hmm. lives in many large organizations. It has to be baked right into your strategy, the beginning to the end. Everything from your procurement practices, your research practices, your product development practices, your marketing practices, your sales and support practices. And of course, it has to be part of your um, human resources strategy. Mm -hmm. Yes. But it's much more than that. Mm. I like the word you use, innovation or innovative. And especially when we talk about disruption, it's always something to do with innovation. <laughs> it could be technology innovation. It could be regulatory, which drives disruption. It could be anything that drives it. And I was speaking to Jeremy Gucci in another conversation who is really into innovation. And we spoke about the need to think outside the box, look outside of the box. And one of the things I've always believed that you can only look outside the box when you bring people that think outside the box, diverse views and technology driving disruption today. There's an element of it that is very global. So we're beginning to serve a global market, which makes diversity <laughs> even more important in terms of what we can do. And I like what you also say about looking at the various channels, because that means that we're creating a culture of diversity and inclusion, yep. as opposed to making it just the tactic when we do certain things. In looking at where we are right now with the current crisis of the COVID-19 how would you say the outbreak has changed the way we work? What are some of the diversity challenges that are being posed right now in response to the outbreak? Well, I think if you look at it generically, it's, it's clear that the outbreak has disrupted many industries. The service industries have been particularly mm -hmm. hit. We know that restaurants and hotels and sporting organizations mm -hmm. Any kind of business that relies on social contact rather mm -hmm. than social distancing has become vulnerable to disruption mm -hmm. and people have lost jobs, businesses are going under, there are some serious negative effects. Mm -hmm. We also know that some organizations have managed to 
to pivot, you know, necessity is sometimes the mother of invention. And mm -hmm. we've seen, for example, universities, which have been very slow over the years to adopt online learning, for example, transitioned over a weekend to classroom-based courses, to online courses. Mm -hmm. All perfect? No. But it shows you that they were able to shift. Similarly, in healthcare institutions, with, where there was often a lot of resistance to telemedicine mm -hmm. or <laughs> digital medicine, suddenly they found ways to implement that. Yes. You can talk through many, many uh, examples of how the COVID crisis has really accelerated work at home, e-learning, online, just about everything. Mm -hmm. I learned to use Zoom, who would have thought? <laughs> Uh, and now I live on Zoom. So there are those kinds of changes. Then there are other changes. And, you know, I've been trying to collect examples of these because I'm so impressed mm -hmm. of, for example, clothing suppliers making N95 masks for healthcare professionals, 3D printers creating tools for, for frontline workers. I mean, Ed mm -hmm. Minsky, who's one of Canada's most famous photographers, converted his 3D printing lab to produce supplies for some of the local hospitals. We've mm -hmm. seen manufacturers, everyone from uh, Magna to Linamar to many others, who have taken their, their manufacturing capacity and shifted it to produce respirators and other tools and technologies that are critically important. It's been really quite remarkable mm -hmm. when you look at some of those, some of those changes. And then, of course, on the social level, there have been new kinds of communities that have developed to help each other. I've been very impressed, not just with some of the neighborhood activities or the, the way in which uh, faith-based groups have adapted, but also when we look at some of the organizations supporting small businesses mm -hmm. or supporting people with disabilities, et cetera, et cetera. They've come up with new models to provide a support when they can't see people face to face. So we've seen massive innovation in terms of organizations doing new things, mm. people having to learn new skills, new ways to operate, and so on. You would also know, however, if we look at this through a diversity lens, that some people are more adversely affected by, than others. Mm who are poor, who live in poor conditions, who are um, people who are older and stuck in nursing homes, people who are in homeless shelters, mm. um, people, who, working poor people who live in a, in a bachelor apartment and suddenly have to find a way to work at home with their spouse, uh, people who don't have private vehicles who rely on public transportation. Yeah. On and on and on it goes. The, the, there are differentiated effects in terms of my ability, for example, to adapt to this being someone who's quite well paid, has lots of flexibility, versus my cleaning lady uh, who, yeah. simply, who simply doesn't. So we have to look at those things. And then, of course, the other thing, and I have a son-in-law who's a physician at Ground Zero in New York City, you look at the impact on frontline workers, not just in healthcare, but the people who are still working in retail, the people who are still delivering packages, the people who are yes. collecting our garbage, flying emergency shipments of, of products. There are also a lot of people in frontline roles that literally are putting their lives at risk because mm -hmm. of work that they do. And I'm sure there are lots of folks working at at uh, big box retailers who never thought that they were going to be considered frontline <laughs> lives at risk for minimum yeah. wage. So there's an awful lot of impacts. And I would argue that in every single one of those examples that I gave you, we can identify how COVID has affected some groups more than others, whether we're talking mm -hmm. about Indigenous people. Yes who already have challenges in terms of housing and access to services and access to broadband, for example, in rural Yeah, the simple things we take for granted. They're, they're disadvantaged in terms of those transitions that I spoke about. Mm. When we look at racialized people and, and uh, newcomers, 
often they're in so lower socioeconomic groups. Often they are more likely to be in those frontline service trees. Mm -hmm. Often they are more likely to live in conditions that don't easily allow them to adapt to social distancing and so on and so on. And we know in the United States, for example, people who are black or Hispanic in New York are dying at twice the rate as white people. Mm. Denying a racial dimension to this is, in my view, irresponsible because we know there's such an intersection between racialized people and socioeconomic groups and so on and so on. Mm. And we look at people with disabilities in many cases, they've had their lifelines cut. They, mm. you know, lost access to basic support. We've heard of people with disabilities dying because the family members who took care of them were quarantined and unable to to provide services. If you think of the elderly mm. category of people with disabilities, you know, lots of the people with dementia and other problems were in nursing homes. Huge vulnerabilities have been created. Yes and so on. And then if you look at gender, we can talk about how women are concentrated in sectors that are most affected, how women who are now forced to work at home are often having to do double duty, keep up with their job, but also homeschool their kids and do all the, the housework because we know that women bear a disproportionate amount of that work. A lot of the young women on my teams who have kids at home are really finding it challenging to find even a few hours a day where they can do their work and they're expected to do their work because yeah. they're on leave, they're working at home. We've spent a lot of time talking to women entrepreneurs. They're very concentrated in different areas than men entrepreneurs. They're more likely to be self-employed than to own SMEs. So they too have been dramatically affected in different from what we see with men. Yeah, I love how you're shining the light on the different issues from the socioeconomic to the accessibility, disabled, to the elderly, to the gender, to the racial issues. Would you say that it is now shining more for light on some of this diversity and inclusion issues that post pandemic, we can start to pay more attention to it. Or is this situation in COVID only going to make it much worse? I think ironically, I think both. So mm. I think that COVID is certainly shining a light on the most vulnerable in society, the people who are homeless, the people who are elderly and, and not being well cared for, the fact that uh, women have to juggle domestic responsibilities, childcare with jobs, gender. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. it's exacerbating some of those issues and people are really having to recognize that we have a crisis of care when it comes to the elderly, for example. Yeah. Fear, however, that one of the impacts over the long term is going to be to set us back decades potentially. When we think about, for example, women entrepreneurs, there's been a significant increase in women entrepreneurs and women's self-employment over the last few years. They are incredibly vulnerable businesses in, in this environment. And many of the government programs that have been designed are not designed to serve the needs of women entrepreneurs. Mm. Really run a risk that all of the work that's been done to build up, to incubate, to create these women-led businesses is going to be set back because a lot of them are going to, are going to die basically in this epidemic. Yeah, so it, it's gonna be a mix of it. One of the key strengths or characteristics we believe of a change leader is empathy. What can we do as a nation or businesses or individuals to create more empathy on the plights and, or, or the challenges that diversity creates? If we're in a certain group, we can recognize if I have an elderly parent, I'm more sensitive to the issues that the elderly face. If I'm in one racial group, I know more of the issues that group faces. But we talk about privileges that when you don't belong to either of this group, you have certain types of privileges and you may not have that empathy. How can a leader have more empathy 
for the various vulnerable groups so that they can help support those groups and pay more attention to the value of even having those groups as a larger part of innovation and leading the society and having a more wholesome society. No, empathy is always for me a bit of a challenge because it's become something that everybody talks about, but it doesn't necessarily get defined really well. So, mm. so what I would say you're talking about, whether you call it empathy or whether you call it understanding or whether you call it being able to put yourself in someone else's shoes, whatever we call it, I think what you're talking about is becoming more aware and more engaged with the mm -hmm. issues that may affect people who are different than you. Mm. I think that there are a couple of different dimensions. So part of it is a lot of people just don't think about what the issues are. So I think we need to use facts. We need to use data. I think we've seen some newspaper headlines that were even shocking for me in terms of the differences in the death rate, the differences in the impacts, the percentage of racialized people who are being laid off versus others, the, the sectors that are affected. I think there's a piece that's all about the facts. Yeah. But also a piece, if you want to engage people's hearts as well as their minds, I think there's also a piece around telling the stories. Mm. And corporate leaders, as well as politicians, really understand what it means to be lower income, living in a small apartment and having to uh, support your mom and your dad and two kids and work at home. That's the reality of many people that I know. Yes. But if you're sort of in the top 1%, those are realities that, that don't necessarily occur to you. So I do think the storytelling is mm. very important. And I think the third piece, quite honestly, is accountability. And I won't, I'm not making myself very, very popular. But, <laughs> but I've, on, on LinkedIn, I've been, Every time I see an example of one of the millionaires or billionaires in the United States, there's a woman, I forget her name, who, for example, just donated $6 million to help other women entrepreneurs. There are CEOs in the States that have said... Sarah Blakely. Uh, yes, Sarah. that's it. <laughs> Sarah Blakely. There are CEOs in the States that have given up their salaries so that people won't be laid off. There are CEOs in the States that have made huge donations, right? Every time those stories come up, I share them and I say, where are Canada's CEOs? <laughs> in Canada, if you, look at, if you look at the earnings of the top 100 CEOs, I think I calculated it at somewhere around $250 million. Mm. There used to be a concept of tithing. My grandparents, who were yes. nice, lived on pensions, never owned their own home, donated 10% of their income without fail every month. Mm. If we could get even the top 100 billionaires in Canada to agree to put 10% of their income towards fighting COVID, that's $25 million. That's a big help. Canada. Yeah, I can imagine why you don't feel you'd be popular right now. <laughs> Canada has more than 40 billionaires, and many of the billionaires are the same CEOs that are in that top club. Mm. Where are Canada's billionaires? Where's Canada's Sarah Blakely? Mm. Where are they? I really haven't, I've seen a lot of corporate decisions where Individual organizations like Van City has decided to waive interest on loans or organizations have decided to donate masks or whatever. But now is the time for genera what, what Vicki uh, Saunders would call radical generosity, like people yeah. need to think about not what the government can do for them. And you see lots of corporate leaders talking about what the government needs to do. We need to focus not on what the government can do for us. Yeah, let me play a little bit. We can us. do. Yeah, let me play a little bit of a devil's advocate. Sure. And I may be totally wrong. No, no, no. What if 
they are doing something, but they're not as overt as other countries or the US because Canada has always been one of a culture whereby we don't always say what we're doing doesn't mean we're not doing it. When you go to some of the hospitals and you see who the donors are, their names that you're not even familiar with. Is it possible that they're doing certain things? And like the scripture says, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Is it possible? You're absolutely right. I'm sure, I'm sure lots of the millionaires and billionaires in Canada are doing things and not talking about it. But I've looked at some of the reports on philanthropic, like there are reports that are published on philanthropy, yeah. and they mostly manage to track down who's making big donations, because a lot of big donations are not made anonymously. Yeah, they have the tax implications. I agree with you 100%. I'm sure there are lots of people doing lots of things that we don't know about. My only point is I don't think we're doing enough okay. as individuals, right? Mm -hmm. I think that the government, I, I've actually been quite impressed with how quickly the government has rolled out programs and when they get feedback, they pivoted. For sure, they've been, been really great, yes. There are still gaps and hopefully the government will respond and fill some of those gaps that we're identifying. But I really think in Canada, this is a difference from the United States. We pay more taxes, but we also expect the government to do much more for us. In the United States, there's much more of an expectation of philanthropy. And I think in Canada, we've gotten a bit, a bit lazy because really, this is a moment where everybody needs to give as much as they can. And it was actually Vicki Saunders as well, who said, you know, we need to be giving until it hurts. And if we can't be putting on masks and gloves and going into the hospitals, what is it each one of us can be doing to make a difference? Love that. Love that. In one of the strategies you mentioned about what leaders can do, you spoke about facts when you related it to empathy. I know your organization does a lot of research, putting reports out there. Can you share a little bit with us what are some, what's some of the work that you guys are doing at the Diversity Institute and the partner institutes you work with that can help lead and drive change more effectively, especially when it comes to diversity and inclusion? Sure. I think in my experience with a lot of the research that we've done, is it really just validates people's lived experience. And that's part of the reason why I think we've had a lot of receptivity. So for example, we did a study of women and racialized people in leadership roles in the GTA. And what we found was, as you would expect, women are underrepresented on boards, in CEO suites, et cetera. But the thing that a lot of people didn't know is that white women outnumber racialized women 17 to one in a city where for every white woman, there's a racialized woman. And that I think was really transformative. We used that data in a number of different contexts, but I think there were a lot of racialized women who didn't want to say, I go to all these women's groups and it's, they're full of women's professional organizations. And there's no one who looks like me, mm. or I go to the C-suite and there's nobody who looks like me. And I think what it did was it provided some concrete evidence that really validated the experience of, of lots of different people. And I think that's why you need that combination of the stories about the lived experience, but also the data. And for me, allyship is critical. I get sick of being the gender police all the time, although oh, I raise women's issues all the time. But I think it's equally important to talk about race, to talk about Indigenous people, to talk about different um, gender identity, sexual orientation, to talk about people with disabilities and so on. Because if it's only women talking about women's issues, racialized people talking about racialized issues and so on, we don't actually um, move as quickly. I yeah. think this comes back to your point about empathy and recognizing that we can understand and advocate for others, even if it's not necessarily our, our own experience. So we've done a lot of research that counts things and really reinforces the fact that there are gaps. We've done other research that looks at things like 
representation in the media. So all of us know that stereotypes play a negative role in all, all sorts of domains, whether we're talking about racial stereotypes or gender stereotypes. One of the things that was the most fun, I was doing a presentation on trades and I did a Google image analysis, you know, so did a search using Google image on the word carpenter. Mm -hmm. And in the first hundred images associated with carpenter, you got men, you got Karen Carpenter, the singer, you got carpenter ants, and you got Jesus, but you did not get any, any female tradespeople. Mm. Right? You know, when we talk about stereotypes being a problem, if you can actually provide evidence of how people are or are not represented, that has a big impact. I've worked with one of my research assistants focuses specifically on Muslim women, for example, which really reinforces the fact that you, you layer levels of diversity, you often layer levels of disadvantage. So we've done work looking at Islamophobia. We've done work looking at really understanding what the problems are. The other piece of work and the stuff that's in some ways more fun is looking at what the, what the interventions are, what, what strategies you can I like that. Mm -hmm. that actually have an impact. And so we know, for example, and I've been working on it for this long, that for 30 years we've been championing increasing the number of women in technology. 30 years later, there are fewer women in computer science and only marginally more in engineering. What that tells you is that the strategies that people have been using have not worked. Oh gosh. Continuing to do the same stuff over and over is just, <laughs> right? There's that, there's that saying that, you know, how do you define insanity? Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. You raise a, another good point. You're raising so many great points around how individuals in groups that do not necessarily reflect themselves can champion the causes for that group, which takes me to one key question I want to ask and my last question for today is, how can someone be a change leader? Because people think only when they're in positions of authority or in management, they can be change leaders. But well, we believe everybody and anybody can be a change leader. And even as an advocate or shining a light on a different issue. So how can anybody out there be a change leader when it comes to diversity and inclusion? What can people start to do more of? I think your earlier point about empathy and, you know, what I talked about in terms of awareness, those kinds of things are important. But I think what's more important is you have to be brave. You have to be willing to take chances. You have to be an entrepreneur. I see the work around change leading and championing diversity as being entrepreneurship in, in a certain way, because you're trying to, you're trying to drive change effectively it's mm -hmm. not profit but it's still the same kind of process you see a problem you're trying to drive change you have to be confident and you can't be a bystander like one of the things that i think has hampered the struggle whether we're talking about women whether we're talking about racialized minorities and so on is bystanderism and i don't know if you know the um there was a lot that was written after the second world war about the banality of evil and the fact that so many people stood by during the Holocaust. Yes. And the, the notion that bad things happen, not just because of bad people, but because good people do nothing. Yes. I think you can, you can point to so many cases in so many contexts with so many different diverse groups and show, for example, when you think about the Me Too movement, the problems around sexual harassment, discrimination with women, et cetera, et cetera, are well known, well documented in many, many contexts. And I can, you know, <laughs> I've worked in the universities long enough. We are not without uh, blot in this regard. Yeah. And yet people have known, people have known for 40 years, 
of some of the practices that have gone on in some contexts and some organizations with respect to how women are treated. And why has nothing changed? Because nobody spoke out. And one, yeah. Whether we're talking about I don't know more, Black Lives Matter, or the Me Too movement, or, or other transformative social movements, part of what happened was people just started to speak out. Yes, and the example you gave about after the war, it's written in a poem, uh, some poetry. When they came for the set of group, I said, it wasn't me, so I didn't do anything. They came for the other group, it wasn't me, I didn't do anything. But when they finally came for me, there was nobody. I think his name was Neil, Neil Moiler or something. Yeah, I'll find it and I'll post yeah. it. I'll find it, but it was, really, it was really great. And that's such a great point to end on when you talk about being brave, being confident and standing up for others and being that lone voice. There is no better description for a leader than some of those words. The ability to stand alone, the ability to be brave and confident and just move forward and not wait for that title or position or power that you think you need before you can do something. Love it. How can people find out more about some of the work that you're doing? I mean, the Diversity Institute website is a great way to find out about some of the things that we're doing. And we're, we're always, even when we're not doing work in specific areas, we really view ourselves as connectors. So we're always happy to connect people to, to opportunities. And I do think that one of the things that differentiates the Diversity Institute is we really think of ourselves as a think and do tank. So I we're, love that. <laughs> we're not just thinking deep thoughts and, and writing about them we actually have made stuff happen. And mm -hmm. when dealing with Syrian refugees or getting laws changed related to women on boards and, and others, we really pride ourselves in being able to bridge the research with driving change. So I'm really delighted to have been included today. I really appreciate the opportunity. Well, thank you. I'm looking forward to 2021 at our conference where you can dig deep into some of these topics, especially how people can be a change leader. And I also love what you've spoken about in terms of also being a bridge. So not just the research and the thinking, but the doing. So a great note. Thank you so much, Wendy, for being part of this today. And we look forward to hanging out with you some more. Thanks so much. It was a pleasure to be included. <laughs>